Welcome to My Life. I'm George and I'm here with Michael Genovese at the Summer Dreams Farm on Seamer Lake Road and we're going to talk about Michael's life today and it has been a dynamic life that in the 32 years that he, that he has. So Michael, we've talked with mom and dad before. We've interviewed both mom and dad. Yeah. Growing up on the Candy Cane Christmas Tree Farm, uh, what were your experiences like? So we came out when I was uh, two wow. years old. So we used wow. to live in Warren. So growing up on the farm is all I've ever known. And You're a um, farmer at heart. Yeah, though. farmer at heart. And growing up, we had lots of animals. We had chickens and peacocks and deer and, and all sorts of animals. And then I, I worked on the farm from a really young age. So it's always, it's been in my blood. It's been in my DNA. I graduated from Brandon High School and, and, uh, and participated in all that. But really, from as early as I can remember, I was out on the farm. So you were tending, tending animals. And then when it came, dad was quite a vegetable farmer. Yeah, so absolutely. Sure you, you learned about the soil at an early age. Absolutely. And watch, and watch really learning from both of my parents, not only how to grow, but um, the work ethic, mm -hmm. I feel like, too. Yeah. Um, Farming's not for the faint of heart, and <laughs> I see, I know I work hard, but looking at everything that my parents did, mm -hmm. I, I have no idea how they were able to raise a family working in Detroit and, and everything else. But not only a passion for the land and growing from my parents, but the work ethic that yeah. I have too. And it's also very faith-based too. I, I experienced Wojo's and their mission statement talks mm -hmm. about with the help of the Lord. Cooks Dairy has a mm -hmm. has a faith component to mm -hmm. their mission statement, mm -hmm. and again, your family is very faith based. Absolutely, and and one thing, um, like a lot of farmers, in when you normally think of a farmer, and we're here on my flower farm, but normally when you think of a farmer, they're they're creating food or fiber, the clothes that we wear, the food that we eat, and and that type of food often nourishes the body but with flowers it's it's food for the spirit or the soul it has a way of bringing joy to people so um so even if you're not overly religious it's it's a spiritual experience when people come out here and see the farm and and experience the joy that the flowers bring definitely so uh Again, you worked on the farm at home as you were growing up, yeah. helped with the, with the Christmas trees. You graduated from Brandon High, and then what did you do as far as schooling? So after I graduated, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, and at, at one point I was thinking horticulture at, at MSU, and then um, I just I decided against that. And I, my freshman year of college, I went to U of M Flint, mm -hmm. and then I ended up transferring down to Wayne State down in Detroit, where I majored in global supply chain management and I got a minor in Italian language. So both my parents are Italian. We, um, uh, that growing up I heard it at home. I wasn't raised speaking it at all. So I studied Italian and that actually worked out. Um, I graduated from there in 2010 and I went into automotive um, purchasing where I spent five years and the company I worked for was owned by Fiat. And I actually had the opportunity to work in Italy so I spent several months working in Italy on different projects and so I was by able knowing to, Italian yeah it helped, it helped out I was able to use my Italian skills um, my Italian skills there so I spent five years there and then I ended up working at um, an import export company that brought in different food ingredients from around the world so I spent time working in Amsterdam also Wow. Yeah. You've had some wonderful experiences oh, then. And then, yeah. then a time came when you said, this isn't me. Yeah, so about a year in to the desk job, and I was in automotive, and about a year into that desk job, I, um, I, I realized sitting behind a computer wasn't, wasn't my thing. Like, I, I needed to get back to the farm. I was, and I still helped out on the Christmas tree farm, but I was itching to get back to the farm. But I was trying to figure out exactly what I wanted to do because the farm, the Christmas tree farm only generated enough revenue to support my parents mm -hmm. and, and I needed to diversify a little bit. So I, at the time I was looking for land, this was 2011, 2012, I was looking for land and trying to figure out exactly what I wanted to do because starting a farm is insanely expensive mm -hmm. and really capital intensive. So I was saving my money and, uh, and yeah, so about a year in I, I, um, I decided I wanted to get back to the farm and then I ended up buying this piece of property in 2014. Wow. 
Yeah. So only five years ago then. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't very long. My this is my fifth year growing, and um, and yeah. So I I started this farm. This actually the field behind us that you see was covered with Christmas trees when I first bought it. This used to be a Christmas tree farm. Okay. Um, not your dad's. But not another, my dad. Yeah. Not my, not my family. Um, so. Over the, the first few years, we were clearing the land. I have a lot of respect for the original settlers that had to clear land with horses. I mean, it was difficult enough with bulldozers and backhoes and equipment, let alone uh, how people used to have to do it. But it, it's taken me several years to clean up, and this is my second year growing on this piece of land wow. commercially. So where did you grow the first years then? Um, over at the um, the same location where the Christmas tree farm oh, is. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, you had some property on the back Yeah, exactly, that, so. exactly. Oh, I had up to about an acre planted in flowers okay. there. And yeah. that compares with how many acres um, here? Last year I was growing five acres of dahlias, which made me one of the largest growers of dahlias in the country, probably one of the top ten largest growers in the country. Um, this year I scaled back to three um, mm -hmm. acres, but last, last year we had quite a bit going on. Mm -hmm. No, that's yeah. uh, it's remarkable. So you you started out and you knew that you what what caused you to think of dahlias? So it's a it's actually an interesting story. So my parents got started in the Christmas industry back in the um, early or late seventies, and one of their original mentors when they were getting involved was a gentleman named Harvey Coop. And Harvey, um, in addition to being a Christmas tree farmer near ha uh, Hamilton, Michigan. He was also a Christmas tree farmer, uh, or a dahlia farmer rather, and he had like 90 acres of dahlias. He was one wow. of the largest grower. He was the largest grower in the in the world at, at one point. And um, fast forward uh, 30, 40 years later, my parents were giving his daughter Janet um, an award on Harvey's behalf. Uh, Harvey had passed away, and we were giving her an award posthumously for his contribution to the Christmas tree industry. And she had given a gift of some dahlia tubers to my parents. So it was like three or four tubers. You grow dahlias from a tuber. And we planted them in the garden. I thought they were the most amazing flowers. I didn't know what a dahlia was. This is like 2012. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know what a dahlia was. And we started growing them. And I got up to a patch of 50. And then the idea kind of clicked in my head. I could do this. Um, yeah, exactly. And people love the flowers. That I would give them as gifts to people at work, and people would lose their minds. Like they would, they would <laughs> see them and be like, "Is this real? Is it so beautiful?" And you just don't see dahlias in your normal florist shop. Yeah, and we'll in the next segment we'll show what some of the examples Absolutely. are of that, and that'll Absolutely. be uh, that'll be interesting. So you you decided to to uh, start the dahlias mm -hmm. and. Again, it was clearing the land, getting the equipment, yeah. and then the the process that you go through. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, I know I helped you this February mm -hmm. with your shipping and the sales yeah. of the dahlias, yeah. and that's that's a big part of the, the job. But let's take a break now, and then we'll come back and talk about dahlias. We'll talk about some of the examples of the flowers. We'll talk a little bit more about Farm Bureau. Absolutely. Thank you. There's a lot of history to Oxford. Hidden around every corner, deep in every crack, and sometimes right in front of you, waiting to be discovered. If you just dig a little, you'll find the great history of our beautiful town. Welcome to Historic Oxford. Catch us anytime on YouTube. Go to Oxford Community Television YouTube. We're back segment number two with Michael Genovese here at the beautiful Summer Dreams Farm. 
and we uh, were talking somewhat about the dahlias and getting started with it, I helped Michael this March. He had one employee go on vacation, and a big part of his operation is selling the dahlia tubers. Mm -hmm. And let's describe, first of all, let's look at the dahlias. Yeah. And some of the examples that we have. So in the United States, there's over 20,000 different registered varieties of dahlias. And they come in all shapes and sizes. So this one's called um, just peachy. This one's a really popular one called peaches and cream. Beautiful shape, beautiful size. But dahlias are really unique flowers. They look different than most other varieties of flowers. Now, when I'm selling a cut flower, um, primarily they're going into weddings or larger events um, or into grocery stores. And I sell at the Rochester Farmer's Market um, in August and September. But um, that, that's the cut flower side. But as you were asking about the tubers, we also, um, dahlias grow from a tuber. Like here's an example, one of the larger ones. Wow. But dahlias grow from tubers similar to a bulb. And every year, all of the plants that you see behind us will have to be dug up. And then through the winter in January and February and March, we're dividing those. And then we'll So it's we'll like a potato. You, you start yeah, with a potato and then, and then the, the tubers divide. Exactly. It's, it's similar to, to what you would see with a, with a potato. Mm -hmm. um, another example of a dahlia like this is, and the variation in dahlias, these are the same variety, but you can see the color difference. This is the most popular wedding flower uh -huh. right here. And how, what, how is that pronounced? Cafe au lait. Um, so this uh, cream and co or coffee and cream in French, but it's, uh, and you can see why, especially in this color right here, it's like um, coffee with cream in it and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. But in terms of wedding flowers, you see a lot of this color, a lot of burgundy, a lot of blush um, used in weddings. So this is a very, very popular flower that we you, grow here. You're very, I guess, in tuned with social media. Yeah. And you were describing to me that a couple of things, Pinterest and also Martha Stewart. Yeah. What's the story behind Martha? Yeah, so dahlias have been around forever, or for a very long time. I think they were first hybridized in the mid 1800s by the, the Dutch. But, um, but back maybe 12 years ago, Martha Stewart started sharing images of dahlias in her garden. And, and a lot of people tell me stories about their grandparents growing dahlias and whatnot, but dahlias had gone out of fashion for a while and then Martha Stewart brought them back. And that one that I just showed you, Cafe Au Lait, was the flower that she really popularized. And once she did that, everyone was asking for it in their weddings and, and even to this day, it's a very popular So in flower. your business, when you offer that for sale, yeah. it's one of the bigger sellers Absolutely. And, one, and one that may sell out the quickest. Absolutely. I normally don't have very many extra during the cut flower season. Um, and then luckily it's a good tuber producer. So each plant's different. Each plant's unique, um, not only in the shape of the flower, but how the plant grows, and then also how many tubers it produces, um, just like you and I are different. So. So Cafe Au Lait, luckily, is a very good tuber producer mm -hmm. also, so it divides very well. We'll plant one tuber in the spring around Mother's Day, and then that, by the end of the season, that'll turn into a clump of tubers, um, and it might multiply five or six times. Wow. Yeah. So that's, that's, in essence, how, with the farm, mm -hmm. you create the tubers that you end up selling. Absolutely. And that's a, that's a big part of your business, and that you you do your harvest you count the bulbs and then one thing i want to say is michael has a a beautiful website oh, thank his you. technology background uh and the studies allowed him to put together a a beautiful uh thank you. website and a a buying system that works very nice so that i i personally used it last year you basically around the first of december mm -hmm. will offer the first batch yeah, sometime after we're done digging and I have an idea. Some last year it wasn't until December. There's a lot it was a very cra it was a hectic year um, last year for a lot of different right. reasons that Whether you're, your dad passed yeah, and my lots dad, of Yeah, my dad passed away right before the Christmas tree season started. So that was that was a challenge. So things were delayed. Normally 
late October, early November is when I start listing the Dahlia tubers Oh, wow. Available. So yeah. so soon then, within, yeah. let's say, the next six weeks, yeah, yeah, an absolutely. email will go out to yeah. The, yeah. the returning customers. Yeah, I announce have. it through, I've got a mailing list that I send things out to, um, and sign up for that. It's on my website. And I also announce it on my uh, Instagram and Facebook. I'm very active on there. Mm-hmm. And social a, media is a yeah. key. Oh, it's huge. Without social media, I I would not have the business that I have. And I feel like in today's world, if a business isn't on social media, then, then it's going to be tough to succeed. Mm-hmm. We found last spring, and again, I mentioned that I was helping Michael uh, with the shipping the orders come in and you, you tabulate, you have an idea of, of what plants, the what tubers the people want, and then you have to sort them out and complete the orders. We were boxing and boxing and mm-hmm. boxing. You sent out to all 50 states, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, all 50 states this past year. And one of the challenges when you're doing <coughs> that is um, it, you have to be inspected by the state to make sure that you're sending out quality product that's free of diseases and stuff like that. So, and each state has a different rule and code in terms of labeling requirements and things like that. So, navigating all of that, there's a lot of pieces. It's more than just planting something in the ground and harvesting it. There's a lot of behind the scenes business work to the farm beyond just growing. When I first started, most of my time was put into growing. Now, I'm hardly out in the field harvesting my own flowers anymore just because we're so I'm so busy with taxes and emails and phone calls and setting up the crew and, and everything else. So yeah, you've got you've got a real reliable group of employees. Oh, thank so goodness! Well, I, there's no way this is way way too much work. I would say um, when you're with cut flowers, it's around. Yeah, this, this is my this, this is, is a, a picture that we took earlier um, in the year. I had an open house in, um, on September 7th this year. I have an open house on the farm. I don't normally open my farm to the public, but we opened it up on September 7th and we did a dahlia wall in the back. So this was a painting. It was solid dahlias, nine by seven. And this was the day after. And I, I took a picture with my crew all harvesting flowers. And without this group, there's, there's no way we could do what we do out here. It's around a thousand hours of labor per acre. Floriculture is one of the most labor-intensive types of agriculture compared Mm -hmm. to someone raising corn or soybeans or something like that where one person can manage hundreds and hundreds of acres. Here, it's a full-time job just managing a couple acres. Yeah, Yeah, all the harvesting has to be done by hand and then dividing the tubers all has to be done by hand. So the the process is you, after this is done, Mm -hmm. you talked about the first week in October, Mm -hmm. you're going to be cutting all this down. Yeah, I take a mower and chop them all down, and then I let them sit for a few days, and then I have a a digger that will mechanically lift them. Like a potato digger. Like an old-fashioned potato digger, yeah. And then we grab tubers off of there and put them in crates, and then we clean them up a little bit more, and then they go into storage. So dahlia tubers, the trickiest part about growing dahlias is storing them, and they have to be stored in a relatively high humidity environment at cool temperatures. Mm. And that's the the biggest challenge. And I, I've put a guide together, and that's available on my website, too, um, on how to grow them and, and how yeah, to manage with the, them. With the bulbs that we have growing at home, we're going yeah. to be going to that website to yeah, figure absolutely. that out. So let's absolutely. take a break, and we'll for come sure. back for the last segment. Sounds good. Thank you. Catch us anytime on YouTube. Go to Oxford Community Television
are back with Michael finishing up the last segment of my life. And again, the setting behind us is very, very special. How many plants have we got out here, Mike? So I'm raising this year around 200 different varieties of dahlias. And like I said earlier, there's about 20,000 registered varieties in the United States. Um, so I'm raising 200 and around 51,000 plants. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that makes me the largest grower of this flower in the Midwest that I'm aware of and one of the larger growers in the country. Yeah. Yeah. That's significant, only being two years here and yeah. five years into the total it's operation. year it's, five this year, yeah. It's, it's, it's significant. Absolutely. So with that, you we do the tuber operation. We're mm -hmm. sending out and boxing and mailing. The post office is your friend. Yeah, uh, I've made, I, I know the manager at the Oxford office very well. Yeah, <laughs> so we, I again, it was fun to be involved mm -hmm. in that process. And again, the, the crew that, the process is all the orders is, yeah. is pretty remarkable how yeah. they just nose to the grindstone and just keep plugging along. That and was, we put in collectively about 750 hours over a two and a half week period. So it was it was controlled chaos, yeah. but it's fun too. And well, you it know, was, each it's like every package that we send out is like a package of joy that's yes. going. I I like to think of it as I'm not selling flowers here. I'm selling an experience. I'm selling how I these flowers make someone feel. And I do that through the flowers, but it's really, it's really that spiritual experience. It's how they make you feel. It's feeding the soul. And, and that is, that's the service that I provide. That's the, the product that I market. It's, and that's the joy, joy you get at the farmer's market or Absolutely. at the open house when people have a chance to Absolutely. see the beauty. Absolutely. I can't tell you, I've had people come up in tears to me saying this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. And I wish I could open the farm up more. It's a challenge because it's production, right? right? And we have orders to fill. And this time of year, I'm working 14, 16 hour days, seven days a week. So it's hard to have a lot of people out on the farm, but I try and make sure that there's opportunities for mm -hmm. people to come out. Mm -hmm. Very good. So we, we do the tubers, then mm -hmm. in the spring, you do the planting and you hope for good weather. Yeah. You've got a major irrigation uh, system. How yeah. much did you say? How many gallons to give a quote? So, that I so have my in my ear. I pump out of a pond that I have on the property. I'm not drawing out of a well. And to irrigate this field, let's say we don't get rain, and I need to put the equivalent of a half inch of rainfall on my field. To water this field, it's about 200,000 gallons of water. So I have a pump that pumps out like 50 gallons a minute. Um, and for me, that's the most effective way to water. This year, I haven't had to irrigate at all. So if I do irrigate, it's only a couple times a year. And that gets back to a whole idea that I have on my farm of really about sustainability mm -hmm. and, and making sure that I have the lowest impact on the farm as I can while still having a product that I can, mm -hmm. that I can grow. And um, to, for me, I equate that, I like to think of it as like a, a triangle because mm -hmm. a triangle is a really strong structural shape. Um, and for me, the, for sustainability, there's three points to it. First and foremost is environmental sustainability. I'm not an organic farm here. Um, and there's several reasons for that. But um, like insect control is something that I have to do on my farm. I like to use the example, if someone was walking down the aisle with, with this cafe au lait dahlia, earwigs will like to hide in the petals of these dahlias. And if a bride is walking down the aisle, with this flower and an earwig crawls out of the flower and starts crawling up her arm that's on not her wedding day on her wedding day that's not acceptable that you wouldn't be happen. a good guy then. no not at all not at all and and a lot of my flowers end up in a grocery store if bugs start flying out of my flowers in a grocery store and the store has to fumigate that's not acceptable right. that can't happen okay so so finding the balance between being able to control the pests but also not having a neg negative impact on things like butterflies. I'm, I'm looking here and I've got monarchs flying through my field mm -hmm. that I see right now. So making sure I'm not doing damage to the environment. I want to be growing here for the rest of my life mm -hmm. and I'm not going to do anything to jeopardize the soil or my health or my neighbor's health. Well, the pest management, it's a little bit like the Ashton's across the way. Mm -hmm. Many years ago, they'd spray whenever on a regular schedule. Yeah, yeah. Now they have traps out. They spray when, when the insects are there. And each farm is going to have a method that works best for them. Mm -hmm. There's no one right answer for any operation. Each situation is unique. Getting back to that triangle, the second mm -hmm. part is physical sustainability for me. Last year, my weed situation got out of control. 
and Kelton and I, one of my main employees, spent three weeks, 12 hours a day, bent over a 90 degree temperature, pulling weeds out by hand. And I'm 32 years old and I can do that now, but in the long term, that's not sustainable. I felt like I was gonna die working <laughs> out in the field. I can't continue to do that. So, so things, things like that. So there's a physical side of sustainability. And then finally, this is at the end of the day a business and unless the farm is profitable, no one is going to be able to enjoy these flowers. Right. This is way too much work. I, I could earn much more at a desk job mm -hmm. than I'm earning off of the farm. I do this because of the joy it brings people and because for me too, it mentally I'm in a good place when I'm out working in my field. So, but it has to make money. I have to feed myself. I have to pay right. health insurance. Right. I have to pay my employees uh, a fair wage. So trying to find that balance between those three things and eat, like I said, each farm is going to be unique in that, but finding that balance between those three things is my idea of sustainability and what's really important for me on my farm here. So people can, uh, your flowers are available again at the Rochester Farmers yes. Market. In and August also and September. In August and September and some florists in the area use your yeah. flowers. And as you grow and expand, probably more opportunities in the absolutely, future. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and it's a challenge to people like the idea of working on a farm like this, but finding enough quality help is always a struggle for anyone in agriculture, but out here, especially because it's so manual, there's only so many stems you can pick in an hour. And to find enough quality help has always been a challenge. So mm -hmm. um, I want to expand out into more markets, new areas, but for right now, I'm comfortable with the point that we're at and I'm going to sit here for for another year or two while i'm working on other infrastructure projects in addition to the farm you have a a strong interest in the farmer organizations and yeah. one organization that your mom and dad were highly involved in was farm bureau yeah. and you too are active as a young yeah. farmer in, in farm bureau almost every year i travel down to washington dc to share my story and my experience of an agri in agriculture with our policy makers, whether that's in Congress. I'm in touch with Alyssa Slotkin's office. Um, in fact, later this afternoon, a representative will be on the farm from her office. I, I've been to the USDA, I've been at the FDA, and talking about different policy that will affect us on our farm. Um, things that are going through the Congress right now and, and some of the, the challenges that we face. So I also do the same thing in Lansing. I've been involved in leadership programs through Michigan Farm Bureau. Without Michigan Farm Bureau um, and, and the, the skills and the opportunities I've had through them, I know my farm wouldn't exist at, at, to the level that it is today without that experience and that organization. I'm also part of um, the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers, which is a group of flower growers across the country and certified American grown, which represents American flowers. And I want to say <laughs> that, that flowers that you see today and that are sold today, 75% of the flowers that are sold in the United States are imported. Only 20 to 25% are actually grown in the United States. And that's another thing I'm really passionate about and sharing that message to buy local and buy from American farmers. As we wrap up today, yeah. we have a special event happening here this afternoon. Yeah. What's happening? So I'm excited that this afternoon, the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue, will be at the farm, which is an incredible experience. And uh, again, through, with farm, my activity through Farm Bureau, that opportunity was made available. So I'm going to share with one of the most important policymakers in the country, flower farming, and, and share our story. Wonderful. Yeah. So for folks that want to follow Mike's business, yeah. go on the website, do a Google Instagram search. Instagram or Facebook. Instagram, Facebook, yeah. uh, Summer Dreams Farm, Michael Genovese. Michael, this has been a pleasure Thank today. Thank you so much, George. I really appreciate it. Your family is special in my heart, as, as you are, too. Thank you. And in the balance you have, I want you to get your horse. <laughs> Each <laughs> year, Michael Michael doesn't have much time with his horse. No, so, no, no. Uh, I've got a horse I've only ridden twice in the last four years. I'm working on the work-life balance yes, side of the Yes, that's farm. the balance you yeah. want, too. Yeah. Until next time. Thank you. Have a good day.